This week on the 77% Street Debate. The fight against drugs in Nigeria is, to me, is almost impossible. They are just scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. You go out to the streets, you see a very young youth walking on the streets, taking hard drugs like as if it's, like as if it's normal. Most drug abusers do it as a cry for help. Mm -hmm. Soaking nails. There are other things you, you do to get high. So Soaking steel nails. Yes, yeah, steel nails, and they get rust. And welcome back to another episode of the 77%. This week, we are back in Abuja, Nigeria. And we're here to ask an age-old question. Is it possible to win the war on drugs? And I want to ask uh, Mr. Mohamed Ajia. He's a commandant of NDLEA. This is a national drug uh, legislative body here in the country. The most recent report by your statistics body indicates that about 14 million people have used drugs at some point. Why do you think this number is so high compared to the rest of the world? Yeah. Well, Nigeria, if you look at the size of Nigeria, okay, population-wise, we are over 200 and something million yeah. people. So 14 is a fraction. Then, but still, it is too high. 14 million people, youth using drugs is too high. So there are a lot of factors that can be adduced as to why they are, uh, why they are using these drugs. Could it be lack of employment in the society? Mm -hmm. Could it be uh, lack of parental care? Could it be broken home? Parents are no more together, the husband and wife are no more together, so nobody to counsel the kids. Yeah. Will it be uh, a lot of pressure in the society, there is no employment, uh, a lot of youth are, uh, have graduated from the university looking for employment, but they could not get one. So a lot of factors can be adduced why a lot of uh, youth are taking this drug. Okay, so let me find out firsthand from somebody who was a drug user but is currently reformed. Uh, Habib, thank you so much for agreeing to speak to us. So. The things that Mohammed is talking about there, those factors that lead people into drug use and abuse, do this sound familiar to you? Very familiar. Yeah, so can you tell us a brief history of how you got into drugs, what you were using, and how long? Briefly, it's all about peer pressure. In high school, you find people who are into drugs, and the parents are not checking up to them. They are free, and they can get it easily. And I want to at the same time criticize him on the fact that the fight against drugs in Nigeria is, to me, is almost impossible. They are just scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. Because recently, um, a police officer, a very prominent police officer, was, was caught in between the line of drugs abuse, um, trafficking. So tell me, if these high profile people are involved into the drug, how can it be solved? Okay, so before we go, because it looks like we're going into the ocean and I want us to stay by the shore a little bit. So let me introduce Hafsa, who's an investigative journalist. I've read quite a few of your uh, reports. Tell us what the biggest challenge is. What are people consuming? How are they getting access to it? I think one thing that we should firstly focus on is the why. I believe, or rather from what we've done, from the reports that we've done on drug abuse, most drug abusers do it as a cry for help. Mm -hmm. It's not that they just woke up and decided to start doing drugs, but rather there's always some sort of stemming reason why they chose to do it as a, as a sort of relief. Yeah. He mentioned unemployment, of course it's one, but we also need to look at the aspect of women. Many women resort into taking drugs from what we have um, reported because of either being married at a young age or because they're divorced. And in northern Nigeria, being a divorced woman is such a taboo to the point that some parents would kick their daughter out. If they kick her daughter out, obviously, where do you think she'll find refuge? Yeah. It's either she finds someone or befriends someone or gets a boyfriend that will eventually push her or influence her into starting drugs. Right. Yeah. I want to come to you, Hamza, because you come from a region in this country called Mpape. Can you tell us a little bit about it, first of all? Uh, yeah, I think uh, speaking of papi and talking about drug abuse, I think you can't take one away from each other. Mm. You go out to the streets, you see a very young youth walking on the streets, taking hard drugs like as if it's like as if it's normal. And parental support, also security and parental support. Those are the two things I think from where I come from uh, really influence youth into going into drugs. Okay, um, let me ask Faisal here because we're hearing a lot of peer pressure being repeated, but surely there are people who start consuming drugs when they're much older. And I mean, 
in their 20s, perhaps in their 30s. At that point, they know better. So it can't just be peer pressure. Uh, peer pressure. Yes, as a matter of fact, it's not just peer pressure. There are other pressures uh, in the society. There is a nature, nurture influence like the society, uh, you know, a place where you, you, you grow up and, you know, the condition in which you live can, can push you to, to, you know, indulge in drugs, abuse and dependency. Yeah. Um, okay, Ahmed, you've been quiet for a while. Let me bring you into the conversation. What is your experience uh, with drug use and abuse, uh, knowing full well that at the moment you're in a relationship with somebody who is currently fighting addiction? Everybody has something to do with the use of drugs. It's either you're using, you have used, or someone close to you is using, or someone in your family is using. Yeah. I don't think there's a home in Nigeria now that... Okay, let me just do a quick survey uh, uh, what he's saying. Any of you know somebody who is directly or indirectly affected by drugs? Please raise your hands. So it's very, very widespread. Uh, okay, so tell me what your experience was, your personal experience. Um, and me? Yeah. There are a lot of alibis to why you would do drugs. Some will say, I, um, I'm into hard labor. I use this as painkiller after working, I do this. Some will tell you it's been a hard day, I can't sleep. When I get home, there's no light. You need drugs, it makes you sleep. Some needs to be awake all night just to walk, probably you need drugs to do that. So one way or the other, you see, it gets us coming back to the use of drugs. Okay. Yeah. I want to come back to you, Mohammed, because a lot of the drugs that are used in this country specifically and also in other parts of West Africa, North and Central Africa tend to be pharmaceutical drugs intended for use for illnesses. Yes. Uh, so how, how are you able to regulate something that is legal against an illegal use? These are drugs that are supposed to be dispensed by pharmacists. On no account should you dispense diazepam, for example. Tramadol, for example, a patient or somebody that is coming to your shop to buy must produce a prescription. The moment there is no prescription and you dispense it to that individual, you are automatically uh, administering the drug outside procedures and ethics. Yeah. And such that pharmacy should be held responsible. Is it really possible to keep track of every single one and make sure they're operating above board? No, it's not really possible to keep track of each and every pharmacy. We have numerous, millions I would say. Even in Abuja here we have thousands of pharmaceutical stores. Although we have isolated cases, pharmacies that are into money, they want to make money by hook or by crook, so they dispense this kind of control drugs the moment you come with your money without doctor's prescription. Uh, but, you know, we're talking about pharmaceuticals or controlled drugs as we're calling them, but people are getting more creative with what they're doing to get high. Can you tell me some of the things and ways that people are employing to get that high? Yeah, These this ways are more than the pharmaceuticals, like you said. We have the local uh, drugs like Zikami and the rest of them. Can you explain what those are? They are natural, uh, natural plants, but when you take them, you feel this feeling, and one minute you're, you're high, like yeah. high as high, so high. People go to extra lengths, like getting highs from the soccer way, and it works. From the what? Soccer way, like a soccer way, a gutter. A gutter, you know, people get high from there. The, the sewage water? Yeah, the sewage gutter, a soccer way, and the rest. Soaking nails, there are other things you, you do to get high. So Soaking steel nails? Yes, yeah, steel nails, and they get rust. And drinking the water? Yeah. Even drugs that are not that are that are legal. Now, when you use them um, a lot, you, you use them in a high quantity, and you get yeah. I, I've heard. Can somebody water. explain to me this phenomenon I've heard called gutter water? Let me ask Hamza because he said that in his area you've seen this persistent use of drugs, and it's normal. Yes. Yeah. Are you seeing these cocktails that we're talking about, and can you describe some of them? Yes, definitely. Like uh, I still remember the first time I saw one. I was I was surprised. I was like, I, I think I was working out with my friend. It was the day I saw he was just bending out the sock away. He was inhaling it. And I was like, what is he doing? My friend was like, he's getting high. I was like, high from that. And he was like, yes, it's also a method uh, from which they get high. And it's, it's rampant from my pleas day. Okay. Um, let me come to you, Hafsa, because we're hearing that a lot of the people are doing what I would consider, quite honestly, crazy. And it is said that many people go into this without really knowing what the effects are. Are you finding this to be true in your investigations? Or are people aware and quite simply they don't care? Um, definitely. I think a lot of them don't know. But then there's also some of them that know, but just choose to feign ignorance. 
and decide to tell themselves that, okay, I might die, but at the end of the day, I have to take these drugs. Like, I can't survive without them. A lot of people that resort to going to the sewers or using Sholisho, which is the glue, and other avenues, to, to be honest. I I've heard lizard say. dung. Exactly. There are so many different avenues, and this is because they can't afford the industrial drugs. Yeah. Uh, so, Mohammed, is your job then an impossible one? Why are you set up to fail? Because if people are going to literally go to the gutters to get that high, and who knows what's led them there, you can't possibly enforce that. You can't control that. We, we, we really have a problem with that. The NDLA Act covers uh, some uh, normal conventional drugs, uh, internationally known. Uh, it is of recent that we begin to see uh, use getting high when they uh, burn and perceive the odor of pit latrines, soccer wings, and all things like that. This is so baffling to me. So yes. this is common occurrence. Le yes. We have a problem. There has to be a legislation that will co also cover this kind of local drugs now that they are emerging. Maybe when the NDLA Act was actually enacted, those things were not put into consideration. What, what, what do we do with the, this kind of What thing? do you do? Do you arrest them? Uh, of course. Te momentarily, temporarily you arrest them, but at the end of the day, you cannot prosecute them because that is it's not covered under our legislation. Uh, so we have difficulty there. Yeah. Uh, Faisal, let me come to you as a psychologist because I think it's really easy to castigate people who use drugs and say, hey, they're a menace to society, they're the problem. But are we failing to understand the deeper issues? Yes, actually, there are deeper issues to drugs abuse and dependency. You know, anything that pleases the brain, the brain will like to have a repeat of it. Addiction doesn't, it doesn't just, you, you just can't get addicted to a drug. Your body system has to tolerate the drug. So it's tolerance that leads to addiction. So psychologically, these people that are using these drugs, they are, they are chained because they can't stop themselves from taking the drugs. Uh, there's this neurotransmitter among the, the seven major neurotransmitters in the, in the body system. If you don't take the drug or whatever uh, is going to calm you down, you're going to start uh, you know, behaving so somehow. You, you might start shaking, you might start shivering. Once you take it or you sip it or anything, you're going to feel this, you know, you'll be so calm. So in that process, the individual is not, even if today they are going to keep a truckload of um, um, NDLEA officers in a place and somebody wants to get the drug, I'm assuring you, that, that that particular neurotransmitter is going to keep on secreting until he finds or he, she finds a way to go and get this drug. Yeah. And listen, of course there is a psychological impact on these individuals and they need to be rehabilitated the right way. Because even when you go back to rehabilitation in this country, there is a big fault in the rehabilitation system of Nigeria. We have to say the truth. Okay, we'll get to rehabilitation shortly. But I just want to tell our viewers that we had invited somebody who used to be a drug dealer. But unfortunately, he wasn't able to come here because, you know, the crowd didn't feel particularly comfortable with that. But this is what he had to say about the issue. Mm, the question that is what we say, which is after the, when I lost my mom. When I was in primary school, then that's when things are fucked for me. So I was being with the one month. So sometimes people came to collect something, then I'll collect it and go and begin. Then today I just feel like, say, what's up? Am I not a man? This guy doesn't have a two head. So something that if you do, you need to help you do it. That was making me start selling drugs then. That's, let me tell you one thing about this drug. Once it has the money, it will be hardly for you to stop it, unless God help you. All right, so we thank Mr. X for his contributions. Uh, and I want to come back to, to, to you, Ahmed, because we're hearing, look, it is completely out of their control. And I know that addicts will get to desperate measures to get the money to get their supply. Have you experienced this with your loved one, where it becomes crazy, violent, or simply toxic? When she's on it, she's calm. When she's not on it, you know, small things tend to be issues. Yeah. Small things like, I've been calling you and you're not answering. I need this, I need that. And if you don't provide that, she goes somewhere else to get it. When you're working with um, people who inject drugs, Yeah. okay, PWID, now some of them will come to, to stages where they don't have money to afford it. But your partner afforded and has used already. So what do they do now? You get some of your blood with the same syringe and you give it to your, your partner and he injects your drug and he gets high.
Yeah, uh, let me just explain to our viewers the phenomenon that Ahmed is describing is called flash blood. Yeah, uh, so have you seen this happen with your own eyes? Yeah, a lot of times. Yeah. A lot of times. Uh, okay, so obviously high risk to injectable and drug transfusion uh, diseases. At the point of addiction, and Faisal, you had mentioned this before, but uh, Hafsa, I wanted to answer this question for me. How accessible is rehabilitation and treatment? Because that's the next logical solution to a person who's suffering from addiction. So rehabilitation in Nigeria is not as straightforward as you would think it is. There are the medically trained rehabs where you can go and get um, psychosocial help that you need, therapy, and all those medical interventions. But then there are also the local rehabs. We've done reports on how we've seen so many cases in Kano where drug addicts are tied up in chains like animals, all in the name of rehabilitating them. Meanwhile, this does not help. It does not work. At the end of the day, once that person breaks free, he's going back to his old ways. But if they're actually enrolled in rehabilitation centers with people that are well-versed or you know professionals when it comes to mental health addressing these issues, hospitals need to have sections where at least they're there's some sort of support when it comes to mental health. And also more um, rehabilitation centers where these people can go and get the, um, the help they require. Yeah. Um, let me ask Habib, yeah, I'll get back to you in a second. Habib, when you wanted to get clean, did you go to one of these rehabilitation centers that Hafsa is describing or how, how did you get clean? Like you said, my own case is very unique. I was miraculously healed. It's just by the grace of God. What do you mean? Like you woke up one day and you decided, okay, I'm no longer doing this and that was it? Yes. Wow. That is why my wow. case is unique. But talking about rehabilitation in Nigeria, I don't think we have any rehabilitation center in Nigeria. We only have one in Abuja, which is good. This is lack of facilities. Just like the prisons in Nigeria, um, prisons are like dungeon for criminals. You just package some criminals and they get to be more fear, um, fearless. But when they come out to the society, they become very notorious. Mm. That's why I said there is no rehabilitation center in Nigeria. So, Ahmed, is this what you were going to, to comment on, where you, you go into a rehab center and you come out hardened? Yeah, that's it. It's like um, a higher institution. Because, um, of learning? Yes, because of the, <laughs> drugs, the drugs you use outside when you get into these rehabs, you get introduced to new substances that are not outside. And this, um, this rehabilitation facilities, they're quite expensive. Most of them I know are... Can you old. tell me how much they are? They're yeah, like 150000 per month, and probably you could stay um, three months. So there's no facility for a poor man. Yeah. That's that um, no two drug addicts are the same. Yes, they may have, they may be taking the same drugs, perhaps have similar symptoms, but you can't just lump them all together and call them all drug addicts and try to treat them all the same. You need to sit down and evaluate, okay, what stemmed the drug abuse in the first place? But obviously he's the mental health specialist. Yeah, let's hear from him. <laughs> okay, she says something very important. You're not going to give the treatment of someone who, who, who takes um, cocaine uh, you know, there are different forms of therapy. There is cognitive behavioral therapy, there's systematic desensitization. So you give uh, different therapies to different individuals with different cases. So there are a whole lot of things that are on the ground that, you know, when, when psychologists, and to be sincere, you know, uh, psychologists are not really valued in this part of the country, in this part of Nigeria. Like, the psychologists are not really valued. Hmm. Uh, let me come to the commander because I saw you itching. The moment Faisal said psychologists are not what? valued, you even held your waist. <laughs> so tell me what you're thinking. No, absolutely what you've said is the right thing. But it's not in all cases. Mm -hmm. The National Drug Enforcement Agency, the FCT Command, we have a rehab center. A mini rehab center that we've been rehabilitating clients. But that's and one for yes, 14 of, million of, users. Yes, out of a lot. That's why I say a lot. If we have scenarios where in a rehab center, they, those that are supposed to rehabilitate their clients, are the people that are supplying those clients drugs, then they should be sued to court. Do you, you have no alternative other than to close that kind of rehab center? Okay, I mean, this is a worst case scenario mm -hmm. where the person who's meant to be rehabilitating becomes a dealer, but we're hearing that they're like prisons. I've mm -hmm. heard situations where people go for rehabilitation in publicly funded rehabilitation centers mm -hmm. only to be chained. No, what she was saying, like in the, 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 the case she was in Kano, we have traditional rehab center. 
where, yes, mm -hmm. by religious yeah. leaders, where you will see a client being chained and all sort of, the, they, they don't even have the expertise. Okay, let, let me uh, let me ask uh, Hafsa because she seems to have. Uh, just hold hold for the microphone, please. He mentioned spiritual um, interventions. Another thing is that a lot of these cases are misinterpreted into spiritual cases, and that's why they. How do you mean? Okay, so jinns. People believe that a lot of people have the impression that it's not the doing of the person, but rather their genes influencing them to go into drug abuse. So ordinarily, they would decide to take this person to a religious leader, a so-called religious leader, or a Marjorie school, and try to intervene maybe by beating out the spiritual elements in them. Oh, when you, you say genes, thing? you mean like the spirits? Yes, yeah, Okay, spirits. Yeah. yeah. So meanwhile, that's not what the person needs. There's mm. no proof to show that the person is possessed in any way. Mm -hmm. And if they are, the way to get rid of them is not by beating them or chaining them. There are other means, but obviously they do not know this. So they just they just improvise, literally. Yeah. They just improvise. Okay, so let's come up with solutions now. There's a reason why the war on drugs was started, because there are far-reaching consequences to the abuse of some of these substances. So what can we do as a society to curb this, given that there's so many young people who are into this habit? Have provide a support system to listen to them. I think it's better to nip it in the bud before it begins than after. I think it's also very important that we have therapists that you can easily walk into. No, it doesn't even have to be a, like someone that's medically trained. Even someone at home, you should be able to, a child should be able to go to his parents and literally tell them what they're going through. If not a parent, a sister, an aunt, someone within their society that they can easily go to and let their heart out completely so that they know that at the end of the day, there's someone there for me. Drugs isn't the only thing that's there for me. Yeah, okay. Hamza, let's hear from you because you are very keen on police officers. <laughs> Besides uh, enforcement of laws, what else can be done? Um, I think they need to erase that mindset that has been created before. Huh? The fear of the police officer. We need to make the police officers our friend. And they need to show it from their own perspective that, okay, you are our friend. Uh, they need to build this relationship between uh, the both parties. So they come into the picture, they help not uh, brutally, yeah. not aggressively, but they come into the picture, get this person, make that person knows the, uh, know that, okay, we are going to help you, or sensitize that person. And also, not only the addict, uh, you see, the parents also need to be sensitized. Mm. They also play a very big role in, you know, um, curbing this yeah. hard drugs. So exercise. a holistic approach towards sensitization yes. and education. Yeah. Ahmed, let's hear from you. First-hand experience, having used the drugs yourselves and now seeing your girlfriend battling with this. What do you think it will take to finally put an end to it? Uh, putting an end to drugs, you need to look at other sites too. Like um, corruption first. Corruption um, in, in the sense of um, this, um, this um, law enforcement agencies, I'm not saying they are corrupt, but you have to check deep down there. Mm. Then the police, people, you're, you're putting this responsibility of fighting this war. Mm. Are they really fighting the war or are they just pretending to fight the war? Good question. Yeah, because you, you, you confiscate a whole lot of drugs. We do see it on TV. The NDA has just put some bags of weed and they put it on fire. Nobody asks what happens to the rest of the drugs they confiscate. So before we, we combat this war, we have to combat ourselves, mm. individuals, first of all. Look internally. Yeah, then secondly, I think the NDA should do more, like rehabilitate users and put them in the system because when, I think when you know the system, you can do better. You don't need nobody to tell you. So I see nothing wrong, but I, I don't know if I'm right, but I think if you have drug cases now, you can be part of the NDLE. Mm. So, but I, I was just thinking you could rehabilitate these people, well rehabilitated people, you get them and put them in the force, and I think they'll do more, more, more good than more harm. Okay, combating. so using fire to fight fire. Faisal, let's hear, you had one more solution for me before we go to the commander. Before uh, a youth in this country is going to become a political thug, you need two things. You need drugs and you need weapons. So now these politicians also do not want 
a situation where they are, they are, you know, drugs is going to be out of the society because they use this youth as political talks. Nobody in his right sense is going to go and you know, pick a ballot box and, and run with it or tr stop somebody you know, during an uh, election when somebody is actually exercising his franchise. So you have to be you know, under the influence of, of some certain drugs. So now you know, the, the, the ball game it moves back to you know, the, the, the society and, and the system. Something needs to be done the executive, the legislative, and also the other um, um, arm of government. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's wind up with uh, Mr. Mohammed here because I started with you. I don't know whether you think these are valid solutions, but I'm also curious to know what more you can have in order to be further empowered to do your job. We are in a situation whereby, for example, agency is underfunded. I know government is trying its best. There are so many agencies, parastatals, and uh, ministries under government all need funding. So NDLA is not an exception. It's an agency that truly, we are talking now uh, the truth, is being underfunded. Mm. So government needs to do better to, to fund the agency, provide us with all the things that we need, and so that you will see our best, so that officers will be able to Put, in their put their best, best foot forward. Yes. Yeah, well, I thank you for the comments, and I think that's a great place to wrap up uh, this debate. Now, at the beginning, I asked a critical question. Is it possible to wage a war on drugs? I don't know the answer to that, but what I do know is that from the discussion here, it is clear that the focus should rather not be on drugs, but on human beings. Thank you for watching.